Well, we're in a series on financial health, and, um, and as Faith says, this is uh, the, the week four, and um, we've looked at what, what is needed to understand the foundation of our finances and what, what needs to be in place. Uh, we've l- talked about one of the key foundational aspects, particularly we took a week on contentment, and uh, that, that really is um, very important to us if we're going to be healthy financially. Um, and then last week we talked about the, uh, the principles of, uh, that a farmer uses, uh, which is of sowing and reaping. And we looked at the, the uh, issues that relate to that, that we need to sow, um, and uh, how we sow, the way we sow, what we sow into matters, and has uh, massive uh, repercussions in our life. Um, and this week, I want us to talk about the habits that are required for financial health. We need to have um, some habits. Now, um, we need, if we want to be healthy in our relationships, if we want to be healthy in our marriage, if we want to be healthy, uh, in, uh, we need to have some habits that, uh, that support that and help us to sustain healthy relationships. If we want to be uh, if we want to be healthy physically, we understand that we need to get some habits in place. We need to have some exercise habits. We need to have some dietary habits. And those habits help us sustain and support uh, the goal of being healthy. And so it's the same with finances. There are uh, some habits that we need to have in place that will enable us to, uh, to be financially uh, healthy in all that we do. <clears throat> the, the key is that if we often in our financial situation can end up in debt, we can end up in all sorts of uh, financial mess. And then often what we do is we pray to God for him to bail us out of that mess. Um, now, God often does that, but God is not going to keep repeatedly bailing you out if you keep making bad financial decisions. And uh, so we need to have, uh, God is looking for us to be wise, he's looking for us to be mature, he's looking for us to actually um, to, to uh, put things into place so that we're not needing a miracle every time, but actually we can believe God for bigger things and for, and for, for, for other things. Because once you are financially stable, you're able then to be able to help others. So you're not just having to Pray for God for a miracle for yourself that you can then be looking and helping others and praying for others that they would have uh, miracles. And, I, and God does do financial miracles. I think it's, it's important that we understand that. I've seen God do uh, miracles in, in my life financially, and I've seen him do financial miracles in so many ways. Uh, we've seen financial miracles for us as a church uh, over and over again, that God uh, comes through uh, when sometimes we don't see a way, God makes a way. And, uh, but particularly, I find that if you honor God and uh, you put him first, uh, that, that God comes through. So, for example, when uh, we have been building this place and we, uh, you know, to, to all intents and purposes, didn't have the finances to do that, uh, we saw God supply in so many different ways Sometimes it was manpower, sometimes it was financially, uh, sometimes it was in materials that were given. Uh, they, we have seen God supply. God doesn't just have to give you finances to bless you financially. If, do you know what I mean? So in other words, when we came in here, many of the lights that were, give, were, were given to us. Um, so we didn't have to buy them. So by saving that, so making savings can be important in what we do. So I want to go through these, these uh, eight habits that we need for financial help, and they each build on top of each other. So in other words, the first habit is the most important habit. Then the second habit is the second important. The third one is the third important. So you can go through that. You can know which is the first of importance and uh, which is through that. And the first one is we need to remember that God is the source of all of our supply. Yes, not your salary, not your spouse, not the economy, not your savings. Our security is in God. 
He is the source through which all things come to us. And so when we put our trust in God, when we realize that he controls all, all things, um, that, that enables us then to approach our finances from the correct perspective. Because if you don't come from things from the correct perspective, then of course everything else um, falls down because you're not getting the crucial things in order. You see, the reason I say that for is because you can lose your job. You can lose your savings. The market can go down. Your, your shares that you can have can plummet. There's, there's all sorts of things that you, if you try to put your security in those things, then, then you're putting your security in something that can fall through, that can change, and can change that's out of your control, where when you make God the source, then in, when something happens, for example, you lose your job, then you know if God's your source, he can find you another job. He can open a new door, and, and he can open up a, a better opportunity. And so we, when, you, when you understand that, it changes your perspective of how you approach your finances. And this is crucial. Deuteronomy 8 and verse 18 says this. Always remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. He is the one that gives us the ability to produce wealth. You see, every economy has wealth makers and wealth takers. Every economy has wealth producers and wealth users. It has wealth contributors and wealth consumers. If an economy has too many consumers and not enough con contributors to the economy, then of course that economy is going to fail. It fails on the personal level and it fails on a national level, yes? So that's why when the government's trying to balance the books, they're aware that often if they don't have enough people contributing in their taxes, they can't just keep going, giving out to people who are consuming the services that the government are offering, yes? Now, we might argue about what they use their, their money on, but, uh, but the principle is that you've got to have um, um, a, a great wealth of contributors in order to supply the need for the consumers. And so it is important for us to, to, to realise that. And when we have too many people taking out of the economy, it ruins the economy, yes? And God designed you and I to be wealth creators, to be people who are productive, or a biblical term would be to be fruitful. And so God wants us to be fruitful. He wants us to be, to be people who can create things, who add to the economy, add to our community, and are not just taking. It's amazing how many times people can just simply become consumers and get an entitlement uh, mentality. And, and this, uh, this happens at every level of society. Now, of course, that's the difference between communism, uh, between capitalism, and Christianity. You see, capitalism says, what's mine is mine, and I'm keeping it. That's capitalism. Communism says, what's yours is mine, and I can take it whenever I want. That's called redistribution of wealth. I can take what somebody else has and I can take it for myself. That's communism. But Christianity says, what I have belongs to God and I, would and I get the opportunity to share it. What I have belongs to God and God wants me to share it. And so it's a very different perspective. Yes, capitalism is what's mine is mine. Communism is what's yours is mine, so I can have it. And Christianity is what is mine. Uh, what is mine is God's. It belongs to God, and God wants me to share it. And so when someone taxes you to help the poor, you don't get any credit for that. But when someone, but when you give to the poor out of your own uh, desire, out of your own finances, because you want to, then you get blessed. 
And God says, I'll bless you when you give to the poor. But if we're just paying our taxes, in other words, we are, we are giving to help the poor because we have to, we have no option, we don't get a blessing from that. Does that make sense? So it's important that, uh, that we understand this. You see, because when we give voluntary, that builds our character. When we give because we want to give, it enables us to become more like Christ. And so we've got to understand the difference between giving when you say, oh, well, I pay taxes and that helps the poor, and, uh, and when we actually give personally out of our own things. So that's the first habit. The second habit is we need to make our money honestly. We need to make our money honestly. In other words, God doesn't bless cheaters. He doesn't bless people who are crooks or deceivers or thieves, yes? So if you get your money in a wrong way, God's not going to bless it, yes? It's not blessed in your life. Dishonesty, Proverbs 15 says, dishonest money brings grief to the whole family. How many families do you know that are grieving and there's problems in their things and they've got financial issues? Dishonesty brings grief. It brings a curse. It brings problems in your family. It brings emotional problems. So let me ask you the question, are you honest or are you dishonest? Yes? In other words, ways that you could be dishonest. Do you give a full day's work to your employer? Or do you go late and get off early? Do you have an extra long uh, dinner break? What I'm saying is, that's not honesty. When they're paying you to be a good worker and you're stealing time, which is money to them, from them. Amen? So we've got to understand that. There are all sorts of things that people pay us for and we can easily be dishonest about. Christians, out of all people, should have the greatest integrity in the workplace and through business. Yes, we should be the ones that, that, that people mark themselves by and say, there is a Christian and they can see your life by the way that you work, the way that you uh, interact with business dealings. So in other words, when you go to the supermarket and they give you the wrong change, do you go back with the right and say, you've given me the wrong change? If, if there's something, something wrong, now we, we're quick to go, if, there's a, uh, if they go to the bill and they've charged us too much, we go, oh, hang on a minute here, <laughs> you know, call the manager over, bring the owner over, bring all the staff over, do you realise that you have diddled me out of ten pence? whatever it might be. But actually, we don't think of being generous, do we? But wouldn't it be fantastic to know that as a church, Destiny Church, that when people go out for a meal, when you're in the workplace, wherever you go, they think they must come from Destiny Church because they've got integrity. They are generous. They are extravagant lovers. And they love, uh, they love me. And they love what we're doing. Amen? Wouldn't that be fantastic? So, it's easy to do that. It's being dishonest with your expenses, uh, your account, or misusing office supplies and resources, or fudging your taxes are all easy ways to be dishonest. And so we've got to think about that, and it's easy to do something dishonest. And, uh, and so I'm not pointing the finger at you, but I am saying that we all need to examine ourselves and make it a habit on that. Proverbs 16 says, The Lord demands fairness in every business deal. He sets the standard. In other words, no lying or cheating in a negotiation. Be honest about the car's condition when you're selling the car. Yes, uh, be, be honest about it, yes? And, uh, and it's easy to not be, isn't it? Is it only me? that struggles with this, yes. I, I could tell you a story about a car I once had and took it to a big garage and, and as it was, I, I, I wheeled it in and it didn't work very well, but I didn't let them know. What is that? Is that honest or dishonest? So say, Pastor, start and be honest. Can't hear you. Absolutely. We've got to be honest, haven't we? Yes, and it's so easy 
to do that, to be honest, about the house condition. You're selling a house, and you talk about, the, oh, well, you know, you don't mention the problems. So, for example, when we had a house in, in Glasgow, in Castlemilk, on one of the roughest estates there, we bought a house. We got it cheap, we might add. Um, but in all fairness, we came because God had called us to England. He'd called us to here, and uh, so we needed to sell our house. Now, of course, we thought, Kath would tell you, we thought no one will buy the house because of where it is. And so, uh, but we prayed about it. And we had bars on the windows, yes, so that because they kept trying to break in. And, um, and that's a whole new story on that. We're having the police living with us for a while and, and all the, and the issues. But all I'm saying is, is that when it came to selling it, we put it on. And we had a couple of, you know, the, the estate agents come round, don't they? And they tell you different things. And, and uh, I think we would bought it for, say, 38000 And we sold it for 45000 Yes? That's not bad, is it, eh? And it had bars on the windows. And it seemed... <laughs> Now, admittedly, it's half the price of any property that was anywhere else kind of thing. But all I'm saying is, is that if you're honest about, what, about the thing, we could have easily gone and taken the bars off the windows going, we were selling. We don't want them to know. So all I'm saying is we've got to be honest in our transactions, haven't we? And not misrepresent things. Proverbs 28 says, if you make money by charging high interest rates, you will lose it all to someone who cares for the poor. God is not against making interest on a loan, but he is against excessive interest. And that's important. So in other words, the loan sharks that charge exorbitant interest rates so that actually if you've ever had dealings with loan sharks and some of the things that they're on, you find their interest rates are um, uh, mind-blowing that actually the person that's borrowed it can never pay it back, can't pay the principal amount that they borrowed back because they're forever paying the interest and the interest is normal. I did a quick Google, first thing on Google, um, things I won't tell you the company, but you can do it yourself. First Google and just put that on and it says uh, the rates were from 45.3% APR to a 1,721% APR. But if you went to the post office, you could get it for 5.6%. So what I'm saying is there's wisdom, isn't there? But people think, oh, no, the post office might turn you down. What I'm saying is if you pray about some of these things, people get, and it's always the poor that end up getting diddled and ended up in debt and more debt, and the rich just get richer. We've got to be aware of that, that if we are doing a loan or we're taking a loan, that we're wise with regard to that and we're honest with it. Yes? Amen. Uh, so Proverbs 13 says this, wealth from get-quick-rich schemes quickly disappears, but wealth from hard work grows. You see, a, a quick, a get-quick, get-rich, quick, get rich, quick, <laughs> a get-rich-quick scheme sounds good. But it's amazing how many times some of these quick, get-rich-quick <laughs> schemes, <laughs> I'll get there eventually, um, they, they often go and they go, oh, well, there's a secret. And, and if you know the secret to the market, or you know the secret to this, and you know this. I want to say to you, as soon as they mention the word secret, I want to tell you, the best thing you can do is run like the clappers. Yes, is get out of there and realize because there are no secrets. All the financial stuff that's out there to financial success is well known. It's not secretive, yes? It's not going. But I'll tell you what, I don't know if I mentioned this before, and I don't know if any of you actually invested in yourself on that by uh, Mark uh, Lloydbottom. And Monica, full, absolutely jam-packed of practical stuff to help you to get your, healthies, he your healthy wealth, uh, financial state uh, going well. Absolutely uh, brilliant. Proverbs <clears throat> 21 says, Steady plodding, brings prosperity. Hasty speculation brings poverty. In other words, we need to make our financial decisions slowly. We need to make them calculated. We don't rush into buying something or purchasing something or signing up to something or investing into something that's kind of, you've got to make a deal uh, there. No, you know, pressured salesmen. It's amazing how many 
salesmen that come. They come to the doors, don't they, for windows or whatever it is. And like, you know, and they, they, they give you this kind of, but we're going to give you 40% off today. If you make the decision, now we get 40% off. Yeah. Uh, but then if you don't do it and you go around the corner, you find somebody else isn't giving any discount and they're still half the price. So all I'm saying is, is don't be taken in by these kind of things. And I'll just repeat it again. Compound interest is the best way for your savings, little by little by little. If you start saving as, as, as a young person, and you, and I know for, for, I speak for myself, and I speak for, I'm sure for, for most people here, that if you, if you start small as a young person and just put small amounts in, it builds up over the long time because the interest you're getting is you're constantly getting interest on that first uh, installment and the second installment and the third installment. And it just accumulates over the time it really does. So thirdly, we need to honor God first. This is the thirst, thir- third important thing. And uh, it's uh, uh, referred to often as the principle of tithing. Um, And so there is a promise with regard to this. And Proverbs 3 verses 9 and 10 says this, Honor the Lord by giving him the first part of all your income, and he will fill your barns to overflow. And the purpose of tithing in Deuteronomy 14 says, The purpose of tithing is to teach you always to put God first in your lives. That is the reason why God wants you to tithe. It's the first part of your income. It's a tenth uh, of, of everything that you, that, that, uh, that, that you earn. Yes? And uh, if, you, if you've been like, when you watch the Robert Morris, even if he gets a piece of furniture given, he tithes on what he thinks the value of that would be. You see, a tithe speaks both of our past, our present, and our future. It speaks of gratitude to the things that God has done and provided. It speaks of honoring God today, and it speaks about trusting God for the future. And so it is important that we understand that. Numbers 18, verse 29 says this, you must present as the Lord's portion the best and holiest part of everything given to you. So God says that the first portion, that's the tithe, of what he gives you is not yours, it is holy to the Lord. And in Malachi, he talks about if you keep these first fruits of what he's given you, then you are stealing from God. And it says this in Malachi, it says, uh, will a mere mortal rob God, yet you rob me? But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. So many people come to church in stolen clothes, drive stolen cars, live in stolen houses because they have robbed God in order to do it. And God wants to see your priorities. So, let's imagine that this is your tithe. Yes? So you've got 10 apples, he's giving you 10 lots of apples, and uh, one of them apples belongs to God, yes? And, um, and so, you, you know, you think, okay, Lord, I know that this, is, uh, this is, belongs to you, but, uh, but Lord, I, uh, I need a new suit. Seemed a good idea at the time. And then, oh, but Lord, I need a new tire on the car. I might need somebody to help me out on this. And then you go, well, yeah, but I owe some money on the rent. I'm just a bit short, Lord. And then you just say, well, Lord, I'm, my savings, I've, just, I've, I've had to dip into my savings, so Lord, I'm just going to, I mean, I can eat it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to, you know, Lord, I love you really, Lord. I really do love you, Lord, and I'll, I'll tell people about you, Lord. But 
you know, my savings. Feels better, Lord, that I've got my savings up. And we go on. And what happens is, we are giving God Delete that from the video. (laughs) And we come on a Sunday and we go, and the offering time comes and we go, Lord, that's yours. What belongs to God is holy. And when you use what God has designated, he's given to you, for you to give back to him as as an attitude of thanksgiving, of honoring him, and of, and of trusting him for the future, you are stealing from God. So I put it out there. Malachi 3 and verse 10 says this, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, the storehouse is where you worship locally, that there may be food in my house. And then he says this, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much, so much for technology. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. This is God's test. This is the only time in scripture where God says, test me. In no other phrase, in no other way, but he says, test me in this. I think that's amazing that God is actually putting his honor on the line. He's putting his reputation on the line that if you will tithe, he will bless you. I think that's amazing. And so one of the things that we do as a church... Because we are so convinced of this and because we have seen it over and over and over again and because you cannot outgive God, one of the things that we do is we call it the Destiny Tithe Challenge. And that's where if you've got Church Suite and you go on to Church Suite um, and you go under My Giving, there is a section where you can either put tithe and offering and various options. One of them is Destiny, um, it is the uh, Tithe Challenge. And if you click under that and you give your tithe for the next three months and God does not bless you, you can have your money back. We guarantee that we'll give your money back if in three months God hasn't blessed you. Because God has promised that he will bless you. And I've seen it over and over again and we've never had to give anything away. So why not try and test us and see if you're the first one? I'm telling you, God blesses. God blesses over and over again. So do that. Or if you're not not sure how, just go uh, to the Connect Void at the back and they will help you uh, to, uh, to sort that. In other words, we have got to plan our giving and not put it on on um, on just emotion, yes? Uh, 1 Corinthians 16 says, on the first day of every week, put aside some of what you have earned during the week and use it for the offering. The amount depends on how much the Lord has helped you earn. And, and so this is important for us, that we just plan our giving, not impulsive, yes? Now, in them days, and, and my early days of working, you got paid weekly. Nowadays, people get paid monthly or four weekly or at different kind of uh, schedules. In other words, when you get whatever God is giving you in any form, the first thing you do is you give him the best and holiest part of whatever is given to him, uh, given to you. And so the issue is about a percentage. So it's not an equal amount, but it is an equal sacrifice. So we all give the same percentage-wise, yes? And that's the way it does. And then persistent. In other words, we do it weekly or we do it monthly. Uh, We do it at at regular intervals like clockwork. And then we do it progressively. In other words, we don't just stop 
uh, uh, you know, at the 10%, you, you, you keep on looking above that. The offerings are whatever is above the tithe. So, um, so for, for example, Kath and I, we tithe our 10%, and then we give an offering of 10%. In other words, we're able to do that, and God just keeps blessing and blessing. Yes? So, in other words... There's not, now we all the time are trying to increase. So you don't have to increase a lot, it might be half a percent, it might be one percent, or whatever it is, but through the years, just keep believing in faith and trusting God, and you will see that. And of course, one of the best ways to give nowadays, of course, is online, and we have all the facilities for that. Fourth habit is to save money wisely. And I know you're probably thinking, what? Save your money before paying your bills? Yes. Because if you wait to pay your bills and to ding, you will spend it all and save nothing. So saving has to be uh, an, an important aspect of that. So in other words, you pay God and then you pay yourself. Yes, you get, you get yourself into, into some savings and ideally 10% savings. So you're living on 80% of your Income. Proverbs 21 says this, The wise man saves for the future, but the foolish man spends whatever he gets. So we need to put God first. Pay ourselves second, then spend the rest on our bills, our repayments, or whatever. We talk about the 10, 10, 80 principle. Yes, 10% to God, 10% in savings, and 80% to live on. You see, God says that your savings... Reveal your IQ. They reveal how smart you are because it's saying a smart person saves. A, 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 an unwise person does not save uh, what they get. They just spend it all. And so if we were to look at your savings, you were to look at my savings, you would see whether or not the, the, that we are wise. Yes? And this was one, I think, a great verse to have <clears throat> next to our credit cards. In Proverbs 21, it says, the wise man or the smart man saves for the future, but the foolish man spends whatever he gets. And Proverbs 24, which is really quite an unusual one, says, develop your business first before building your house. In other words, before you buy those curtains, before you redecorate, before you buy a new piece of furniture, make sure that you have invested in your future, invested your money so that it's working for you. When your money's in the bank and it's getting interest, it is working for you, isn't it? You're not working for the money, it is working for you once you put it into savings. So we need to um, obviously earn before we spend. Ecclesiastes 11 says, invest what you have in several different places because you don't know what disasters might happen. This is the principle of diversification. In other words, we would say, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Think about where you're putting uh, your, your savings. Or a money manager would say, a balanced portfolio. Yes. Why? To minimize risk. Because if you put all your savings into one thing and that goes down, then of course you've lost everything. But if you diversify, you are spreading the risk uh, in that. And uh, Proverbs 13 says this, money that comes easily disappears quickly. In other words, whatever it is that you can get quickly, uh, whether it's a loan, whether it's a lottery, whatever it comes easily, but money that is gathered little by little will grow. Little by little wins the day. Compound interest, yes. I, I don't know if I've mentioned that before, but it is. So in other words, start the habit, Start small, but start is so important. Fifthly, keep good records. This is the principle of accounting. Write down what you spend so you know where everything is going. It's wise to keep track of your finances. And some of you are maybe very good at this, but I find that for most people that get into financial difficulties, it's because they don't have a budget. They don't know where their finances are. Uh, going. So we've got to keep track of our finances because it has a habit of walking away if we don't keep track on it. And Proverbs 21 says this, plan carefully and you will have plenty. 
If you act too quickly, in other words, impulse buying, you will never have enough. So the key is the planning. The key is having a strategy in our finances. Yes, we will have emergencies. I have emergencies. You have emergencies. But if you don't plan emergencies in, it's going to take you by surprise and you're you're never going to have enough and it's going to really set you back. So if you don't expect them, you're not going to plan for them. So in other words, if you don't expect ever to get laid off, you're not going to get planned for laying off. But if you think I could lose my job at some point, you start thinking about what you need to have in place so that, so that when that day or if that day comes, you are prepared for it. Amen? So it's important for us to know the state of our finances. Four things we need to keep a good record of. What you own, what you owe, what you earn, and where it is going. Those are the four things that we need to do. And so we've got to understand. Sixthly, we need to plan our spending. That's called a budget. Plan your spending. So tonight, the CAP course, it will be talking through various areas, and one of the areas is budget. And so you will have the opportunity to look at your finances and to make a budget. I think you go away and do it. Now, I just want to clarify one thing is no one will see your financial situation on the CAP course. So it's not like you go to the CAP course and, every, and people kind of go, oh, so that's what he's earning, is it? Oh, so he's got that much debt or whatever. It's not. It's personal. It is just teaching principles and, um, and it gives you it's a great workbook to go through and helps you to kind of budget and to know where things are and to do that. And the, the great thing with the CAP course is, is if you are having problems, and most people don't, and certainly for the most problems that we do have, we find that the CAP course helps us uh, with the process. But is if you do have and you're in a dire strait, you can go, we call, press the button. And when you press the button, it takes you through to the CAP course um, uh, organization of professional people that will come and help you with your finances and they can talk to the financial institutions if need be. Yes, that's what they're experts at. Yeah, they, they're good at it. They do it all the time. They, they have been people often in, in massive financial industries They're the kind of people that actually raise financial institutions and create them. So they they are guys that know what they're doing, okay? Um, And uh, and so if need be, they are there for you, yes? So if you want to get out of debt, you've got to nip it in the budget. (laughs) Okay. Proverbs 21 again. Stupid people spend their money as fast as as they get it. And we all too often do that. But the reason, one of the reasons I'm preaching this now is because we are coming up to the most impulsive purchasing season of the year. Christmas. This month, November and December, I want to tell you, they are out for your money. They want to take it from your account into their account. And there may be a transaction but they're quite happy with that because they have got your money. And, uh, and the amount of people that are in debt, I don't know if you remember the days of the catalogue. People would spend on a catalogue. Uh, they're of the devil, I think. But anyway, um, but they, but they, but they, you buy them and then you're, paying, you're paying all year to pay them off. And then when you've paid it off, guess what? It's Christmas again. And so they're off. I want to say to you, think of other ways to... to, to Uh, show your love for other people. It doesn't have to be expensive and it doesn't have to be bought. It could be made. It could be just uh, designed. It could be any number of of things. So, you know, and people say to me, or should I say, I say to Kath, look how much I've saved. And Kath goes, no, I can see how much you've spent. (laughs) Yes, no, 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 but the saving, the saving. And we all get sucked in, don't we? Then four letters, suck us in. S-A-L-E. Sale. We're in a sale. It's Black Friday. It's a bargain. And we go in and we buy things that we don't want to impress people we don't even like. So good planning, Proverbs 21 says, and hard work will lead to prosperity, 
that hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. Number seven, set up a repayment plan. Proverbs 3 says, don't withhold repayment of your debts. Yes? In other words, we don't get out of debt automatically or by accident. Yes, we have to have a plan to get out of it. And again, this book has some great stuff on how to get out of debt, some really practical things about what you can do and who to pay first, that kind of thing. And um, because we've got to realize you don't get into debt overnight. You get into debt because of a series and a, a repetition of bad habits of, of overspending and, and doing things uh, that are that. It's bad choices that get us into debt. Now, okay, there are exceptions. There are, uh, you know, we've seen people, for example, they bought, bought a new car and then they've lent it to a friend and that friend has gone and crashed the car and they're not insured. And so that can cause you massive issues for years to come. Yes? So there are exceptions, but generally speaking, we get into debt because of our own mismanagement of, of, of our finances, because of our lack of discipline. And if we are willing to make the tough choices, we can be out of debt. Yes? Um, and so that's important. Eighthly, and lastly, and I'll finish with this, is commit it all to God. So the first habit was, remember it all comes from God. And the second habit is we must commit it all back to God. Yes? So we saying, God, my life, my wife, my time, my relationships, my money, my future, my job, it's all yours. I will live your way, not my way. And Proverbs 16 gives us a promise. It says, commit your work to the Lord and then your plans will succeed. You see, our biggest problem is not debt. Debt is just a symptom of a deeper problem. It is a symptom of dissatisfaction and a lack of uh, commit commitment, a lack of discipline in our lives. You see, we've got to remember that happiness is a choice. And you and I are as happy as we choose to be. And so often we are looking for things to fill a gap and a void in our life because we have not found our happiness in the one who is the source of happiness. God is the source of happiness. He's the source of hope. He's the source of your wealth. He's the source of your creativity. He's the source of, of, the, of, of everything about you. You are here because he created you. He formed you in the womb. He is the one who you owe everything to. And so it's because of him. And so we have everything to be, to be happy about of what God has done for us. So let us, let us really bring that to God. Amen? So let's stand together and let's... Uh, and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that as we develop these eight habits as a church family, and as we begin working out our financial fitness, we ask that you would bless each one of us in the, in the house and those online and those who will watch later. I ask that you would bless them personally in their finances and bless them in their families bless them in their workplace bless them Lord Jesus in the community and with their neighbours I pray Lord for people that are struggling today I pray that you would open up new job opportunities I pray today for miracles of financial provision I pray today for doors to be opened that would enable your people to be able to walk through and to know your blessing. We thank you, Lord, that today that we come to one who is able to do that which is beyond us. We thank you that today that we worship a God who is a miracle-working God. We thank you, Lord, that when we honor you and we put you first, we thank you, Lord, that when we get our finance in order, when we, when we become disciplined, when we start to, to choose to be happy and to be content, that, Lord, that you open doors, you change things, you change things in us, and you enable us to see what we haven't been able to see. You enable us to appreciate the things that we haven't been able to appreciate. So I ask for miracles of blessing. I ask for miracles of money. I ask for miracles of turnaround. 
I pray, God, that you would create unexpected moments this week for your people that would enable each one of them to know in God I trust. In Jesus' lovely name, amen.